All right. Um, so thanks, Joe, and uh, thanks for organizing this awesome conference. I've been uh, learning a lot. And I'm really excited to tell you about some of our work using um, an open source 3D printer. It's called the RepRap for basic research in regenerative medicine. So uh, what is regenerative medicine? You know, we've been talking a lot about stuff that's happening inside the cell. So um, let's talk about stuff that's outside the cell, so sort of the tissue level, the organ level. So um, there's kind of two competing ideas and sort of visions for the future of uh, human medicine. And the first one is kind of depicted here. Um, it's that of kind of tissue engineering, and uh, it's that of the bionic human. So we've seen this a lot in the past several decades of television. Um, it's based on the idea that any sort of problem in the body can be eventually treated with a device. So um, if you need a total knee replacement, if you need a hip replacement, if you need a pacemaker, uh, if you need a cochlear implant to be able to hear, if you need, uh, now they have retinal implants. Um, so these types of therapies have really helped the people that need them, but uh, these are not really uh, permanent solutions. So these are basically, most of them are based on uh, older designs from a lot of plastics and metals. They'll never fully integrate with the body. They may only last about a couple decades. And uh, there's also plenty of other tissues that are not really addressable with this type of device um, analog. So recently, uh, the National Institutes of Health has put forward this idea of regenerative medicine. And uh, for this idea, as their mascot, they've picked actually Prometheus from Greek mythology. Now, Prometheus was chained to a rock and sentenced to have his liver eaten every day. Uh, this is not the most optimistic vision for the future of humanity. Uh, but what gets the National Institutes of Health excited about this idea is the idea that uh, after his liver was eaten, it would naturally regenerate. So the idea is can we induce or uh, kind of stimulate or kind of replace function uh, in these types of organs that are much more complicated that can be addressed with a device? So organs like the liver, the kidney, the heart, uh, the pancreas, the brain. And can we do this in a way that it will fully integrate with the body? If you get these therapies when you're young, maybe it will grow with you and maybe it will be a permanent solution. And the theory is basically that cells are always going to outperform devices in these types of therapies. So regenerative medicine is already working in the clinic, and there's plenty of patients that have these types of therapies that have, have been healed, essentially. Um, so this is a 2D scaffold that is seated with the patient's own cells. They can use it for a skin replacement for burn victims. There are corneal implants. There's a, a total bladder replacement. They take this 2D scaffold. They can sew it up into a 3D shape. They can seat it with the patient's cells. And so what, are the, what is the challenge for um, scaling these to these more solid organs, the 3D organs, the organs that have many more cells? So I would say it's actually a geometry challenge. So we already know certain materials that can degrade well in the body and integrate well. We already know how to grow plenty of cells or isolate primary cells. So any of you, if you came to the lab, even if you've never done tissue culture before, in about a day we could make you very proficient in growing or isolating literally billions of cells. And this is about the, the size of the therapies that we want. But what I would say is uh, what you really need to think about is the geometry of the organs and how are we going to deliver nutrients and oxygen. And I was trying to think of an analogy for this. Um, I think it's actually, it's, it may seem kind of silly, but if you think about a loaf of bread, right, uh, in terms of oxygen delivery. So when you put a loaf of bread uh, in the oven, a loaf of dough, what happens is you get this crust that forms. And this is chemically, this is uh, oxygenation, and you're getting a chemical reaction here. It doesn't matter how hot you make the oven, you're never gonna get oxygen delivery as high in the center as you do on the outside. And this is really the challenge. How do you get nutrient delivery into solid organs, solid assemblies of tissues in a way that you can give them nutrients before they all uh, suffocate? So you can see this directly um, in the body. The, the challenge is really the blood vasculature. So the vasculature in your body is the best uh, highway for delivery of oxygen, oxygen and nutrients. And the liver is a perfect example. This is a very large organ, but almost half of the volume of the liver is blood vasculature. It has this very complicated, interconnected, uh, multi-scale architecture. So multi-scale means it has many different sizes of these diameters of channels all connected together. We have no idea how to make anything like this. So if any of you have an idea, you should uh, let me know and we'll talk about it more. But um, so this is kind of a strategy we think can help to address this space over the long term um, using open source technologies. So those of you familiar with 3D printing, uh, you may think, what if we just print the cells and the gel? So the supporting matrix is mechanically kind of like jello. Can we print the cells and the gel directly? And this has had a lot of success uh, so far in research. 
But uh, there's a lot of cell types that are, that are very interesting that you might want to use for this type of, of research, like liver cells. But the liver cells, they don't actually survive this process too well. And we don't know how to change the cells to make them survive this process yet. There's a lot of people looking at this, and it, and it definitely needs a lot more funding. Um, but we kind of thought maybe there's a, a different way that we could approach this. So uh, sometimes if you take a step back, you can kind of reconsider maybe there's a different way things can be done. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen the Body Worlds exhibit. So this is a whole organ vascular cast uh, from a human kidney. And what you see is this very complicated architecture. So when I saw this in the exhibit, I thought immediately, well, this is really the structure that we want to make. And if we could make this, maybe we could make this first. Then we could take the cells, that the, even these fragile cells like liver cells, put them around this type of architecture afterwards, and then maybe we can make it out of a material we can remove after we put the cells around it, and maybe it wouldn't kill the cells if we picked the right material. So it's kind of a weird idea, right? How would we do that? So um, at the time, it was kind of kicking around in my head. Um, I'd seen a lot of 3D prints that had come off of these open source 3D printers and these kind of interesting structures here. And uh, maybe you could think about 3D printing something like this, but these types of materials are not really suitable for that approach. So right, this is uh, basically an epoxy resin. These are these bioplastics. They, you can dissolve them with chemical treatments, but anything strong enough to dissolve these types of polymers would just immediately kill all the cells that you would put there anyway. So um, about a year later, uh, I was at a restaurant. I had dessert. Uh, you should always have dessert, actually. Um, and what you notice here, don't look at the flan. Look at this sugar cage here. Right, so this is actually exactly uh, the type of structure we would want to make. So mechanically, it's a very strong material, and we know it's already biocompatible. It's already in your bloodstream. So the idea is, can we take something like sugar, something that's mechanically strong, um, and maybe kind of make it in, uh, with a 3D printer or something like that in the shape of an organ? So uh, kind of similarly, they're all basically just a series of tubes. And, and this is really the scenario that we're trying to use to try to make this analogy. So this is a schematic overview. So basically the idea is we're going to try to take a 3D printed filament network. We're going to try to make it out of sugar. And we're going to try to pour gel and cells. It's sort of like a liquid pre-polymer. And it'll polymerize and solidify around the sugar. After it solidifies, the sugar is going to change from the solid into a liquid. We can then remove it just by perfusing that vascular network that we made. And then maybe we can keep cells alive. So how are we going to do that? right? So there's plenty of 3D printers. 3D printing has been around for a long time. And if you talk to any of these commercial companies, this is the scenario that you go through, right? You talk to the, you call up the company, hey, uh, I want to spend $100,000 to buy your printer, and I just need the schematics because I want to modify it to be able to extrude sugar for biocompatibility studies. And they just don't even know what to answer to that. They have no, nothing in their byline for responding to customers. They don't want to show you the schematics. You can't even explain to them what their technology could do if they would give you the schematics. So this is basically a non-starter, and this is why we turn to open source. Um, so I think most of these uh, points have been made uh, today and yesterday, so I won't harp on them. But um, I think you know, open source is really why science works, and we're kind of getting back to that scenario now. Um, and just sort of the benefit of when you're releasing your designs out there, that is setting the standard that other people will follow. And uh, so besides, this, besides uh, people don't have to reinvent the wheel, and you can actually radically remix things to be able to make uh, new discoveries. And I would just kind of push the idea of um, it's more the, uh, the customer model versus the collaborator model, right? So um, if you are uh, going closed source, basically you want everyone to buy something from you. You're not going to make it easy for them to modify versus in science, you really want everyone to be your collaborator. We all have stuff we can learn from each other. And when you release those designs out there, you're going to find ways that people are using your technology. You had no idea that was even possible before. And people are still going to actually approach you for feedback and for guidance and for collaboration. So I think that's really the power of open source. So that's what we did. So we took the uh, RepRap open source project. We joined the project. We started to modify all the designs. Um, so this is now the RepRap project. We've changed the extruder to be able to extrude sugar. So it, it's uh, air-based extrusion. Uh, Arduino is the open source. Uh, it, platform people are using for the motherboard. RepRap is uh, RepRap.org. This is me sort of pouring this gel containing cells all around that uh, sugar lattice there. So this is also the, uh, I would say it's the best tasting research I've ever been a part of. Um, so it's, it's a really cool material to work with, the sugar. So mechanically, it's a glass. And so anything you can make with sort of 3D glass work, you can make with this uh, open source 3D printer. 
So we pour the gel around there, we can actually pump human blood through there at very high flow rates. You can see going through these junctions here, um, you can make these lattice structures, and we're gonna really start to try to deliver nutrients and oxygen into these gels that contain cells. So if we're gonna deliver nutrients and oxygen, we go back to that idea of the loaf of bread, the slice of bread. What if we make a big gel that doesn't have vasculature? Can we, define, can we design um, sort of uh, uh, molecular reporters of cell function? And when you do that, you get a gel like this. So this is sort of looking at a cross-section through one of these gels. And we have cells everywhere in this gel. These gels are fairly large, about a one milliliter gel. They have tens of millions of cells in them. And you see, just like a slice of bread, you get activity all around the outside because that's where the cells are able to access oxygen and nutrients. And then in contrast, if we make these gels perfusible with these vascular uh, conduits that we're making by molding around sugar, we get these really interesting structures. This is a higher magnification. Now this image processing was actually done with other open source projects. There's one called Hugen and also ImageJ. So Hugen is a panorama software that people are using for their, um, their vacation photos. And I found it was actually quite useful for um, microscopy images and stitching them all together. So there's actually more than 100 uh, microscopy images stitched together. Every single dot there you see is a single cell. And this again, just kind of a cross section through that. And we can see also this works uh, with those liver cells that I mentioned before. So this is a different type of assay. Here um, in red and green, it's kind of hard to see, but in green is a stain for living cells, and these are primary hepatocytes, so the primary liver cells. This is kind of the outside of the gel, and then these are these perfusible channels. And we can find that the cells survive as a function of radial distance coming out of these channels. So, um, you know, I'm really excited to tell you about that we got this uh, published in a peer reviewed journal article. All of the open source projects that we use, we were able to put them in the acknowledgments, and you should definitely check them all out. Um, there's different uh, Python, the Python was a great scripting language we used. I talked about um, some of the other ones. And I would just kind of uh, push the idea that really open source. Uh, don't get caught up in the semantics. Open source really is a philosophy, not a checkbox. So it's a philosophy of you working with other people all around the world, any time of day, and uh, people really uh, will come together to help you solve your problems. So kind of where is the future of this going? Um, how are we gonna make these larger scale structures? This is kind of a long-term vision where we could go with this type of technology um, sometime in the future, we think. Uh, so maybe taking that sort of liver vasculature I mentioned in the beginning, if you get that from a micro CT scan, uh, CAT scan, you can convert that to a 3D model that is itself 3D printable, or you could do network-based analysis of that vascular architecture. You can make that uh, de novo from scratch on the computer, and then make that also into 3D printed file, maybe 3D print that directly then, something in this material like sugar, and then uh, put that in your gel and sort of start perfusing um, the gel that way to keep cells alive. Now, how are we gonna fund this, right? So um, we talked about many different funding models. Is there a way to kind of crowdsource funding for this, this is not, uh, we don't want this to be a fad. This is probably gonna be a 30 year project. How are we gonna do that? So uh, here's one idea and I'd be interested in your feedback. So because this is open source and because it's inexpensive, um, I actually purchased my own 3D printer that can do this and we're using our hackerspace to print chocolate. So this is actually a 3D printed chocolate. It's tempered chocolate so you can see it's solidified there. It's liquid here and I'm interested in the idea, maybe we can use 3D printed foods as a funding mechanism for the basic research whereby the technology we need to improve the food-based printing is gonna directly improve the technology we need for 3D printing the sugar for the regenerative medicine applications. So we can do these types of, uh, these are just our basic feasibility studies with chocolate. We can do uh, sugar. This is actually a, an octopus, which you'll see after we zoom out. Uh, so this is basically taking the whole RepRap tool chain, taking a 3D model, converting it into instructions, and uh, this is a, a pretty tasty octopus there. Um, we're already tra starting to get some traction, so um, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, boingboing.net, so Cory Doctorow, he had his head scanned on Thingiverse, and uh, we were able to 3D print that, and uh, we presented it to him, he was in Philly last week, and uh, this is, he's candy now, so, um, so thank you. Okay, here we go. Awesome work. Um, just the thought that came up, uh, it seems like you have a uh, next generation of Petri dishes. So that might be something with uh, open biotechnology that you could cross promote. Yeah, um, I think uh, one of the big, uh, uh, I guess, advantages or, or uh, 
flexibilities that we have with the system is that we're at high reproducibility. And uh, I think that's, that's touched on when you're talking about petri dishes. You want to be able to do something, um, not just make one gel, but be able to make dozens of gels in one day that have identical vascular architectures that you can really start to do quantitative assays on. And I would say this technology is already at scale there. We've done dozens if not hundreds of these gels, I personally have, and it is very scalable because you can separate the 3D printing from the cell and matrix handling considerations. So um, yeah, I think kind of moving everything into 3D would be uh, a great application. I was wondering how the 3D scaffolding was made and um, is normally made, like advanced tissue sciences brought dermograph to market, as the artificial skin you showed. Um, how, what were the other, what have been the other means used to make three-dimensionally three patterned scaffolding. Not everyone needed to do vasculature. They always needed scaffolding to get the cells to differentiate and develop properly. Yeah, um, it, it, I, we could talk about it for a long time, maybe uh, afterwards. But I, I can summarize it that um, basically most of the cells, you're talking about the scaffolding that cells need to attach to. So most of the cells in your body, they need to be attached to something in order to survive. So a lot of cells that just get injected in a, a suspension form, they will, like 99% of them will die immediately. The reason I asked so, about AT ATS, yeah. Advanced Tissue Sciences, is their patent portfolio went on the market when they went bankrupt, and I was part of a founding team of a company that bought part of that. Um, and the key to ATS was their emphasis and development of 3D scaffolding. So they started um, with regular fiberblasts, actually from foreskin, and, and then grew it in, in shapes. And it needed to be on, a, on a, um, a carbohydrate scaffold, which was then consumed by the cells that it grew out in these nice sheets and differentiated. So I'm not, they weren't suspensions. That's right. So um, it's sort of, uh, it's that slide I had in the beginning showing the, um, the sort of thin tissues. So what happens is they'll make a, a 2D scaffold first. Basically, it's not, it's not technically 2D, but it's, it's maybe less than a millimeter thick. And they can make the material first, so it maybe is processed collagen. There's natural materials they can use. There are synthetic materials they can use. They make that first, and it's sort of um, microstructurally, it's sort of like a sponge. So it has pores that they can seed cells on. The, the cells will uh, fall into the pores, and they will get seeding of the cells in that structure. But that doesn't really scale into the third dimension very deep. So um, even if you can seed cells very deeply in those types of structures, you can't get the cellular densities that are normally found in the body in these sort of organs where it's, it's about tens to hundreds of millions of cells per milliliter. And uh, even if you could seed them, they would all die within a couple hours for most of the uh, sort of metabolically highly active cells that, that we were talking about, sort of the liver cells. So fibroblasts can survive longer um, without oxygen, stuff like that. But, um, uh, this is a really cool project, um, and I'm definitely interested in talking to you about funding, crowdfunding in Great, project, yeah. uh, later, but in terms of the design decisions, have you explored like crowdsourcing some of those, and, and especially as our capacity is different between, you know, what technology is available, um, our, how are you tapping into like crowdsource design, I guess, for this? Yeah, um, so all of the design modifications that we made to the RepRap project, we put them back online. So you can download them today, you can try it out. Um, the extruder is very, very simple. And I think we're kind of taking this bottom-up approach where instead of having to partner with somebody that is making a $100,000 printer and then trying to modify that where nobody else could do it, the fact that we're starting with a, with a printer that is maybe $500 or $1,000 um, that even I can afford to put in, in the hacker space um, I think we're going to start to see a lot of designs come out of the community that may be useful for testing in that sense. And I'm hoping that that will help to standardize some of the vascularized gel research that's out there, is that if everybody can decide this is the best architecture to use for perfusing these gels, then maybe we'll see people able to actually reproduce some of the other work that's been, been done. So, Thank you very much, Jordan. That was, was great. <laughs>